everybody. Welcome to our newest Google Hangout, where we are thrilled to have Richard Lazarus with us talking about the Lucas case that we read last week. Richard is an incredible person to join us. Uh, he holds the Howard and Catherine Abel Chair in Law at Harvard University. And at Harvard Law School, he teaches courses on environmental law, natural resources law, torts, and Supreme Court advocacy. You know, in the United States, if you're a lawyer, your dream is to argue even once in the U.S. Supreme Court. Richard has participated in 40 Supreme Court cases and argued in 13 of them already. And as you'll see, he's incredibly young. <laughs> <laughs> he is uh, also the author of two uh, of my favorite environmental law books, uh, the Making of Environmental Law, and, and one of my special favorites, Environmental Law Stories. Richard, we're delighted you could join us today. Well, thank you, Don. It's great to be here, and it's a great program you're doing here. Well, this makes it even better, being able to share someone with your experience, you know, with the world, uh, with our 20,000 students in all over the world. Richard, last week we read the Lucas case, uh, the case involving a setback requirement on a South Carolina beach that prevented a, a landowner, a property owner, David Lucas, from actually building on two lots that he had purchased for half a million dollars each. And he argued successfully to the US Supreme Court that it was a takings requiring compensation. Uh, you litigated. You played a role in litigating that case. Could you tell us something about what it was like to litigate Lucas? Well, it's actually quite a thrill. Uh, and, and that's something to say since we lost the case. Uh, but, but it was certainly a, a thrill uh, to do, uh, mostly because uh, of the attorney that I work with uh, in South Carolina. Uh, as an attorney representing a South Carolina government lawyer, worked for the state, uh, for the South Carolina Coastal Council. His name was Car Cotton Harness III, uh, and very much a South Carolinian. Uh, and he had this case uh, in front of the court. And like most lawyers, he had never had a Supreme Court case uh, before. Uh, in his life, um, and he was not a voluntary person there. In other words, he had won in the lower court, and the other side had asked for the United States Supreme Court review, so he found himself all of a sudden uh, in the court. Uh, and typically when that happens here in the United States, uh, those kinds of lawyers are at a disadvantage uh, because they don't know what the Supreme Court is like, they've never been there uh, before, and in a case like this one where the government is trying to regulate private property rights, uh, and at the time, uh, people knew the Supreme Court was increasingly conservative, and they knew the Supreme Court was quite skeptical uh, of the sort of value um, and the efficacy, sort of the effectiveness uh, of restrictions, environmental restrictions of private property. Uh, a lot of people saw the Supreme Court, once they granted this case, as a real opportunity to cut back on environmental protection. So you had Cotton Harness on one side uh, representing the state and environmental regulation, on the other side, you had enormous, very powerful economic interests uh, in terms of uh, the business community in the United States. Uh, so it was, for me, it was fun and interesting. This is an issue I'd worked on literally since the very first case I worked on out of law school, uh, was the, what's called the regulatory takings issue. Uh, and it was a chance for me to really help somebody out. Uh, and the good news is he was a really nice guy. Uh, and in, 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 in legal practice, for me, that means a lot. Uh, not all lawyers are, are nice, friendly, uh, warm people, uh, and Cotton was a really good person to work with. And so that was really, it was a thrill to work with him uh, and to try to craft uh, a position uh, with him, a legal brief and an oral argument in a case where it was quite clear the Supreme Court had taken it to rule against us, uh, and our job was to try to figure out some way we might be able to persuade the court otherwise. Richard, I mean, you mentioned that you lost the case. Uh, what, since the case came down, since the decision came down from the Supreme Court, what are your observations about, in practical terms, what its practical significance either was or, or was not? Yeah, and Don, it's a great question, because when I say we lost the case, what we lost was the court took a judgment of the lower court that had been in our favor, and they reversed it. Uh, and in the world of law, that by itself is a loss. If, if they affirm it, it's a win. If they reverse it, it's a loss. Um, 
So in that way, we lost the case. But what really makes a difference in the longer term, and we talk about the United States Supreme Court, it's a longer term, it's the opinion. Uh, it's not the judgment of the court. And in the opinion itself, the reasons the court gave uh, for why we lost, although I would have far preferred an affirmance, almost as soon as it came down, uh, we looked at it and we thought, actually, we can ironically live with this. Uh, that this is going to be, uh, although it looks like a huge loss for environmental protection, this is what in the world of the Supreme Court we would call a soft landing. Uh, and quite often in the Supreme Court what you're trying to do, if you think the court's not going to rule in your favor, you're trying to at least get the court to do a soft landing, which is they rule against you based on reasons that you can live with. And not only live with, you actually might be in pretty good shape with. Uh, and that wasn't obvious to most in the Lucas opinion that this was a soft landing, but for those of us who were really buried and immersed in the case, uh, we thought actually there was a lot of good news in this case that South Carolina was going to lose this case and this restriction most likely on remand, but that in terms of environmental protection statutes and restrictions on development of ecologically fragile ecosystems, that the court's reasoning and the vote breakdown were such that we actually probably going to be in okay shape uh, for the longer term. Now, Richard, was one of the, the reasons behind this was that the court made such an, a big deal about there having been what, in its view, was a 100% economic wipeout of okay. David Lucas, suggesting anything short of that might not be the sort of categorical takings that yes. the court announced. Yeah, there were, there were sort of uh, several things. That was certainly the core. The fact is, we pushed very hard in our briefing. Uh, that everything depended upon that finding. Uh, and we also tr argued that finding was inaccurate. Uh, uh, we were hoping the court would actually go behind the finding. Um, but the court refused to go behind the finding, which we thought was just inaccurate. And that's not a surprise in the Supreme Court. They're very reluctant, understandably, to revisit factual findings. But the other side of our strategy, which is what you've alluded to, is if we were going to lose, the court was going to base the ruling against us on that existence of that factual finding, a 100% wipeout. Because our feeling was, if the court's ruling really against us was based upon the existence of a 100% wipeout of all economic value of the property, that would have never happened again. Uh, and so the case would almost become a, a sport uh, in that sense. So the fact that the court actually did that, they ruled against us, but on that single fact, that was considered to make the case not only potentially a sport, and by a sport in this context what I mean is a circumstance that would never happen again, a sort of a one-off case, uh, but also our hope was, and this was something which I speculated about at the time, we only since realized was the case, is that actually not only would that fact never happen again, or that if it, the fact that it wasn't happening in other cases would help us. Uh, and, and this is sort of a hard thing to understand for most, and that is we could argue in the future, because this is not like Lucas, the court should be less likely to say that it's a taking uh, than, than before. So the, the Right. So I, you know, I have a, um, <clears throat> a thought about that. I mean, I'm curious. Uh, even, even as a 100% wipeout, since Lucas came down, I mean, almost... Of course, the very next year after the state of South Carolina adopted its setback requirement, Hurricane Hugo, right. which was at the time the most destructive hurricane in U.S. history, not only hit the United States, it hit South Carolina, and it didn't just hit South Carolina. From what I could tell, it hit this location. Right. <laughs> it no. happened. When, when the court came out with its opinion within a matter of months, Hurricane Andrew, uh, which even to this date is the most destructive hurricane uh, in U.S. history. Uh, and then, of course, there were things like Katrina and, and Superstorm Sandy more recently. Ever since this case came down, the wisdom of what South Carolina right. did, even, even in 100% wipeout, wipeout cases, seems to have been borne out. Yeah, ab absolutely, absolutely true. And, and the fact is, the, the one worry we had after Lucas, and this is the biggest worry we had after Lucas, um, was that we thought we could actually live with the opinion and how the opinion would really work could actually be to our benefit in terms of trying to have these kinds of laws. 
Our biggest worry after Lucas is that people would read the Supreme Court had ruled against South Carolina, just that fact, and they'd overread the significance of it. And you'd have states and local governments who were trying to do responsible things think incorrectly, but think, we can't do that anymore. Uh, and therefore, you'd have all these important, valuable laws not get and not get passed and and and, and apply to land, not because in fact they couldn't do it constitutionally, but just because they'd be worried that they couldn't do it. Uh, so after the argument, this is a really interesting part of litigation in the United States, um, and I cannot think of another case where we did this. I've ever done it before. We were so worried about this, the fact of a reversal, people thinking it meant more than it did, and not getting into the details and realizing they could still do this kind of very important regulation. That we actually had a series of meetings after the oral argument, before the decision came down, where we practiced exactly what we would say the morning that the case came down if it went against us. Mm. Well, exactly what words we would use, how we wanted, which is why I had this sort of tongue-in-cheek. I wrote an article, you know, on Lucas called Putting the Correct Spin on Lucas. Uh, what I didn't acknowledge there was actually, that's exactly what we did. Uh, not in that article, but we actually were ready to spin Lucas exactly the way we wanted to, that it came down, if it came down wrong. And our reason was we thought it was so important to make sure that state and local governments around the country did not think this was a significant ruling uh, that intruded on their ability to pass these kinds of laws. And we knew that the other side was going to be claiming a huge victory, uh, and they would try to get people to overread it. You have to worry a lot, not just about what the law is in the United States, but people think the law is. Um, and often there's a gap uh, between the two. So I remember I talked to the New York Times the morning it came down, Linda Greenhouse, uh, just a terrific Supreme Court reporter uh, for the New York Times. She called me on the phone and she said, um, you know, tell me about the significance of the case. And I started telling her about why, even though the judgment was reversed, why it was not a significant loss for land use regulation and why land use regulation uh, could still survive and actually thrive under this. And she stopped me for a moment. She said, you know what's really interesting? No one today who I talked to is willing to tell me this is, on your side, this is a significant ruling. Uh, I mean, she, she smelled that, that, that there was something going on. Uh, one brief irony, if you don't mind me moving to a different topic. No, it, let's do it. We only have a couple minutes left, so it's perfect. Well, anyway, it was the last day of the term when they decided the Lucas case in 1992, and only other, one of the cases was decided that day. Uh, it was an abortion case. Uh, it was a, a case called Casey v. Planned Parenthood. In that case, the pro-choice people had won far more than they ever thought they would win, but it was so important to them for political reasons to claim a loss that they were claiming a loss on a day that they had won, while we were claiming sort of a win on a day that we had actually lost. <laughs> that's, you know, that's an amazing thing, and it's wonderful for uh, students in the class to get an inside story like this from someone who's actually there and who is regularly there arguing in front of the Supreme Court. Richard, I, I, I can't thank you enough for, um, for, for coming on it and, and being a part of this first ever international worldwide course on environmental law. Well, Don, this is a great thing you're doing. I mean, it's a wonderful uh, first step uh, and a wonderful course and opportunity, and not just for the students. Uh, of course, you and I are teachers. This is what we do. Uh, and so for us to be able to reach uh, people and interested students all around the world, uh, I mean, for us, that's the honor. There you have it, everybody. From Richard's mouth to your ears. <laughs> Richard, we are delighted you were here. Uh, it's good to see you, as always. Thanks, Don. Carry on. See you soon. And Bye. everybody, keep an eye out for the next Hangout.